Psalm 25, reading from verse number 8, the Bible says, Good and upright is the Lord, because therefore he teaches sinners his way. The humble he guides in justice, the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, such as keep his, com his covenant and his testimonies. In other words, the Bible is reminding us this morning, number one, that God is a God of integrity. Whatever the Lord says, he will do it. He will not promise you something in the open and then disappoint. He will not promise you something in the, in the, in the, in the closet and then disappoint you openly. Our God is a God of integrity. He said, God is upright. Good and upright is the Lord. The next thing I want you to see is that the psalmist is trying to remind us this morning that the Almighty God is a God of mercy. He said, all the path of the Lord are mercy and truth. In other words, no matter how many times you mess up, the Lord does not decide to remove your name just because you made a mistake. The Lord Almighty's intention is not to wait and just be looking out for the time that you will fall. Many of us will fall, but we rise up. And the intention of the Almighty God is for us to continue to grow and to develop. So the Lord is a God of mercy. And many of us have enjoyed His mercy. By this particular person standing and speaking to you right now, has been a recipient of the mercy of the Almighty God. The Bible says, wait not for the mercy of the Almighty God. Many of us would have been consumed because the mercy of the Lord triumphs over His judgment. Okay? If the Lord Almighty determines to do something, His mercy always overrides it. So whatever we have done, as long as we recognize that we are not in the right and we come before Him and ask for forgiveness, the Lord Almighty will always show mercy. And that is what the, the psalmist is trying to remind us. And then finally, the psalmist is telling us, this morning, of the faithfulness of the Almighty God. The faithfulness of the Almighty God. The Bible says, all the path of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep His commandment and His testimony. In other words, the Lord is faithful. As long as you walk with Him, as long as you do what you need to do, the Lord will always do what He Himself will do. The Lord Almighty can never fail His people. He can never disappoint His people. The Bible says that God is not the man that He should lie, or the son of man that He should repent. Whatever God says He will do, He will do it. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but His word will never go without being fulfilled in your life and in my life. And so this morning, as we continue our month-long celebration of how far the Lord has brought us as a church and the height to which the Lord is taking us, I'll be sharing with you what I started talking to you last week about, started talking about the meaning and the importance of the lifelong anointing, what it means, and how you and I can tap into that particular anointing that is forever present when we walk with the Almighty God, how you and I can tap into the blessings and the covenant that establish this particular commission. And in our first installment, I talked about, I know I was, I, I, I kind of tried to define what it means means what lifelong anointing actually means and we said a lifelong anointing is the perpetual power and the presence of the almighty god in the lives of individual when the lord decides to walk with you and you decide to walk with him there is a presence that the lord gives you there's a power that comes from that presence and it's not something that the lord intends for just for a season it is something that is supposed to be with you all the days of your life that is what lifelong anointing is all about lifelong anointing means the unfair failing enablement of the spirit of the almighty God in the lives of the people or in the life of the church. In other words, there is a panel... There's a kind of an enabling power that the Lord gives you when you start walking with you. There is something that the Lord Almighty empowers you. It gives you an ability, a strength to continue walking, even when you do not have the ability to, even when you are tired. And that is what is referred to as lifelong anointing. And finally, I talked about, I said, lifelong anointing is about the everlasting faithfulness of the Almighty God. Men may fail you. People around you may fail you, even family members will fail you. But as long as we have that relationship with the Almighty God and we keep on walking with Him, His faithfulness is everlasting. So lifelong anointing, lifelong grace, lifelong power, lifelong enablement is what the Lord is the faithfulness of the Almighty God towards His people. And that's why the Bible tells us in, uh, in Psalm 89, 
Psalm 89 verse 34, the Bible says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the things that have gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn in my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, his throne as the sun before me. He shall be established forever as the moon and as faithful witness in the heavens. In other words, God is a God who when he decides to walk with you, if, you, if anything goes wrong, it's not because he changed his mind. It's because you either stop walking with him or you have done something to cause him to look away from you. So the Lord is saying, the faithfulness of the Almighty God is what lifelong anointing is all about. The presence of the Almighty God that never disappoints, that is what lifelong anointing church is all, lifelong anointing is all about. The goodness of God that never changes just because of our inconsistency, that is what lifelong anointing is all about. And so when the Lord finds an individual, the Lord gives that individual a specific assignment. And as long as that person continues, embraces that assignment and an, an, an enabling power from heaven comes upon you. You are able to walk with the Lord because of that power. And he will continue to sustain you as long as you walk with him. And that is why every day he renews your strength as you keep walking with him. And I remember telling you last week that the name of the game in Christianity is consistency. Okay? You don't do it one day and stop tomorrow if you want to see the result. You have to keep doing it over and over and over and over again for you to get the results that you are looking for. So when he anoints, when he calls, he anoints. And when he anoints, he sustains the people as long as they choose to continue to walk with him. So the thing is that seeing that God is faithful to his people, the question that we started looking at last week was how are the people associated with the call of God? How are the people associated with the anointing of the Almighty God? How do they tap into and experience that lifelong anointing? How are the people connected to this particular commission going to experience uh, the joy of the lifelong anointing, the blessings of the lifelong anointing that the Lord has placed upon a commission like this? How are you going to experience that lifelong anointing? And we said that the way you experience it is that the Lord passes you through some specific experiences. And the first experience we talked about was the experience of the Abel Mehola experience. And what is that? What does that mean? We said that Abel Mehola experience is the experience of rebirth. The experience of being born again. The experience of having a divine encounter with the Almighty God. It's an experience of salvation. It is not enough to come to church, my brothers and sisters. It is not enough to read the Bible on a regular basis. What is important for the Almighty God and what it matters, what really makes a difference is, uh, have you had an encounter with the Almighty God? Because the Bible makes us to understand that only those who have a relationship with him. He said, my sheep knows me and they hear my voice. He said, the voice of the stranger they will not hear. Which means that unless there is a relationship, the anointing does not come. The blessings does not follow. So we are saying that for us who are under a commission that the Lord Almighty is saying that there's an anointing. There has to be a point in your life when you have met with the Lord. If you are going to experience the lifelong anointing, we must have at one point in time in our life encountered the Almighty God. At one point in time, you will have said, Oh Lord, I break from my past life. I'm not going to live the way that I've lived again. There's a time when you have consciously surrendered to the Almighty God. A time when you were born again. The fact that you came to church and somebody laid hands on you and you became healed, that is not salvation. The fact that you came and you say, oh Lord, I was traveling in an accident. I had an accident. I did not break my head. I did not die. As such, I said I was going to follow. That is not salvation. Salvation is you coming to the realization that life without Christ is a life that is meant for eternity. In, in the, that is uh, the, uh, eternity apart from Christ. It's a, it's a life, is a realization that yes, you need Jesus Christ to be able to enjoy eternal fellowship with the Almighty God. That you need Jesus Christ to be able to break this yoke of sin, that Adamic nature that keeps us walking in circle of sin. That you need the power of the cross to break that cycle. You have to come to that expect, come to that particular realization for you to be born again. And until you get to that point, you will find out that the the experience enjoying the lifelong anointing becomes a mirage. You must go through your own Abel Mehola, your own experience of being born again. You have to be saved 
for you to have access to the anointing. And so this morning, as we continue this particular series, I'll be sharing with you the second experience that we must have if we are going to enjoy what I refer to as the lifelong anointing. And this second experience that we have to go through is what I call the Gilgal experience. The Gilgal experience. In 1 Kings chapter 19, you all know the story the Bible tells us that Elijah the prophet was about to be translated into heaven. And the Lord wanted to find a replacement for him. The Lord now told him to go and anoint Elisha as his own replacement. And the Bible tells us that when Elisha went and was, when Elisha went, when Elijah went and found Elisha, the Bible said that Elijah threw his mantle upon Elisha. Elisha received it and Elisha started walking with the Lord, started walking with Elisha and serving him. But the fact that Elisha, started walking and associating with Elijah. The fact that Elisha now began to walk in the company of Elijah does not necessarily mean that, that Elisha will have access to the anointing of Elijah. It doesn't mean that. The fact that you are in church doesn't make you a Christian. Just like the fact that you stand in the garage for a long time make you a car. You don't become a car by sitting down in the garage. You are still a human being. The same thing. Elisha did not have access to the, uh, to the anointing of Elijah, the anointing of Elijah just by associating with him. Elijah had to go. Elijah had to go through certain things before God can entrust the spirit of Elijah upon the life of Elisha. Elijah had to go through a series of experiences. Elijah had to go through some of the things that require that is required for you to be qualified to enjoy the trust of the Almighty God. God had to pass Elijah, Elijah through a series of life-changing experiences. First, he went through the Abel Mehola experience, and which is this experience of salvation and encounter and surrender to the Almighty God. But the next thing Elisha went through was the spirit was, was an experience that I refer to as the Gilgal experience. And so in 2 Kings chapter 2, reading from verse number 1, the Bible says, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. Here the Bible is telling us that the road to the lifelong anointing will always pass you through, will always take you through Gilgal. Elijah, Elijah was seeking the anointing that was upon the life of Elijah. And Elijah understood that for him to get it, he has to go through, he has to go through Gilgal. And the Bible says that Elijah and Elisha was, you know, was, you know, were traveling through, you know, they were traveling from Gilgal. That tells us that they must have been in Gilgal at one point in time for them to be traveling from Gilgal. Okay? So they were at Gilgal, they were either, either they were stayed at Gilgal or they went to Gilgal to do something or there was something in Gilgal. The question is, why is Gilgal important that the Bible had to mention it? Why? What is so important about Gilgal that Elijah and Elisha had to be traveling from Gilgal? Had to go, and they, they could have gone through different ways, but they had to go through and come from Elia Gilgal. What is so special? Why, what is the, what is the Gilgal experience and why is it so special that the Lord had to mention it? For you to understand the place of Gilgal in the story of Elisha and the story of the children of Israel, I want you to go back to the book of John, uh, to the book of Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. And I want you to start reading from verse number 2. And the Bible tells us there. It says, at the time the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knife for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knife for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the heel of the foreskin. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who had come out of Egypt, who were male, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people, that they stayed in their place in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. In other words, this passage is telling us, number one, there is a command to circumcise. That's what you see in that Joshua chapter, 
And that just shows chapter 5. A command to circumcise. Number 2, there is an obedience to the command of God to circumcise the people of God. Number 3, there is the reason for the circumcision. Why is the Lord asking Joshua to go about and take, you know, and circumcise the men? And then there's a reason for circumcision. And then number 4, the significance of that circumcision. I want you to notice in that verse number 9. Because of the obedience of Joshua to the instruction for circumcision, the Bible tells us that the Lord God Almighty, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, he said, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, therefore the name of the place is called, uh, is called Gilgal. Which means that as long as you remain uncircumcised, the reproach of your old life stays with you. As long as you remain uncircumcised, those particular sin that you have been rushing and struggling and fighting with will remain with you until the Lord cuts them off. As long as we remain uncircumcised, the condemnation of the past will be remain in place. As long as we remain uncircumcised, the enemy will continue to dredge up the things that you have done. We'll continue to bring those things to your remembrance. We'll begin to accuse you in the presence of the Almighty God, saying that this person, this is what they did before they came to the Lord. So the key is a constant reminder of your area of failure. Because the children of Israel, the Bible says it was a reproach upon them. You remember in our in 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 Bible reading this morning, the Lord Almighty says that those who are not circumcised among the children of his people will do what? They will be cut off. And for Israel not to be cut off, the Lord Almighty now gave Joshua a strong instruction. Say, go ahead and fulfill the path of that covenant so that my people can continue to enjoy the promises that I have made unto them. So the question still remain: why is Gilgal important and why is it necessary for you to go through the Gilgal experience? My brothers and sisters, Gilgal experience is, 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 is important because the Gilgal experience is the experience of circumcision. The experience of circumcision. That is the experience where you cut off that which will identify you with the world and now make you to be identified with Christ. The experience of circumcision. That is why Gilgal is experience. Number two is the experience of purity. Gilgal is, a, Gilgal is important because it gives you an experience of purity. When that particular foreskin is taken away, it tells you now that you are separated unto the Lord. You are dedicated unto the Lord. You are now the person that God identifies with. Number three, Gilgal is important and necessary because Gilgal is a place of separation. It's a place where you make a distinction between you and the people in the world. And that's why the children of Israel were referred to as the circumcised. And every other person who is not a Jew is referred to as uncircumcised. It separates people. Gilgal is a place of separation. A place where you say, I'm no longer going to live my, my own will. I am ready to be identified with Christ. Gilgal is also a place of internal change. The Bible tells us, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So the circumcision we're talking about here is not just the physical circumcision that, Joshua, that uh, Joshua performed. It's talking about the circumcision of the heart. Something must happen inside of you. Something must change. There must be a cutting away of something in your life that will make you fully qualified to be able to walk with the Almighty God. Number five, the Gilgal experience is important because it's a place where covenant promise is reestablished. The people who will walk with God must be the people who have the covenant promise. The Bible makes us to understand that Abraham was supposed to carry the covenant of God on his person. If you go back and read that Genesis story. Say so you will put that covenant upon your body. And that is you will identify it by the circumcision of your foreskin. And the children of Israel had to go back. They had to go back to the point where they reestablished that covenant because they were in jeopardy of being cut off from the presence of the Lord. The Lord said, bring these people back. Make that circumcision. And as soon as this was done, the Bible told us that the reproach was taken away. So Gilgal is a place where covenant promises are renewed. It's a place where God Almighty looks upon you and takes away that particular reproach. Those things that the enemy looks at and points out and says, after all, you say you are a covenant people. This is the covenant of God and you are not fulfilling it. You say you are supposed to be circumcised. Here you are. Here are all the things that are still coming out of your life. It's a place where God makes us 
people who are devoted, people who are separated unto him, people who can be identified with him. Now that we have a general idea of what the Gilgal experience is, the question is, why is Gilgal necessary? Why is Gilgal necessary? Gilgal is necessary. Sanctification is necessary. Purity is necessary because it is the place of consecration of the believer. If you pick a Jew at the time of Joshua, before that circumcision, and you begin to identify with them with the people around them, you couldn't tell the difference. But after Joshua went through and obeyed the instruction of the Almighty God, what happened is that they now became the people that can be recognized, the people who are called the circumcised. So it's a place of consecration. It's a place of devotion to the Almighty God. Gilgal is necessary because it's a place of consecration of the believer. Gilgal is necessary because it's a place where God had compassion upon the people of God who were about to lose the blessings of heaven. Because they were about to lose the promise of Abraham. And the promise of Abraham was a covenant that was made, that was carried in the body of Abraham. And as a believer, the covenant that you have with the Almighty God is that you should be circumcised in your heart. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 36, it says, a new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you the heart of flesh. And any Christian... Or anyone who is identified with Christ, who has not had the experience where their stony hearts are taken away and a new heart is given unto them, that one has no portion with Christ. Because you cannot serve God with an old, in an old wine skin. There has to be a new wine in a new skin. And the Lord Almighty is saying, Gilgal is the place where I have compassion on you. Gilgal is important because it's a place of cooperation with the Almighty God. It's a place where you no longer fight with the Lord. It's a place where you're not striving with the Spirit of God. The Lord says, do this and you do it. And you can only do it when that Adamic nature has been taken away. Gilgal is a place of right alignment. Where you align yourself with the purpose of the Almighty God. A place where you say, Lord... I am willing to be able to line up behind your purpose. I'm willing to do what makes you happy. I'm willing to follow the path that you prescribe for me. It's a place of proper alignment. A place where I don't want to be a rebel and walk on my own. And finally, Gilgal is a place of submission. Because circumcision, I can, I can, I can assure you, is not pain free. You take a grown up man and you begin to circumcise him, definitely is a very painful experience. It's a place of painful experience and because you know there is a pain associated with that particular process, it's a place where you willingly surrender yourself and say, Lord, do what you need to do in my life. Purge certain things out of me. Remove certain things that will not allow me to move forward. The things that bring reproach into my life, the attitude and the, uh, and the behavior and the disposition and the way that I talk and the way that I behave that has been bringing reproach into my life, this is the place where I'm saying, Lord, I lay it upon the altar and I say, Lord, let there be changes to be taken away. So Gilgal is a place of submission. That is why it is necessary. And there are, these are the reasons and the, what, you must, what, you must, what you must understand is that, for you know, because Gilgal is that place of submission, that place of pain, that place, oh, that place where the Almighty God does the work in our hand. If anyone does not have the time or does not take the time to visit Gilgal and have that work done in their lives, that particular person will not be able to access the lifelong anointing that God is talking about. Gilgal is a place. If the Gilgal experience is lacking in the life of an individual, if a person who is associated with Christ has not taken the time to be able to rid himself of those things that are not glorifying to the name of the Lord, that person does not become a vessel that the Lord Almighty will use. And what you find is that when the Gilgal experience is lacking, when an individual has not taken the time to purify himself and purge himself, there are certain things that you will see in that life of that individual. And the first one is carnality and inconsistency in their work with the Almighty God. 
A person who has not taken the time to go to the foot of the cross. A person who has not taken the time to visit, to visit Gilgal. A person who has not taken the time to purify and purge himself. The Bible makes us to understand that carnality and inconsistency becomes the portion of that person. For you are, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal? I am walk as men. That's what Paul the Apostle was saying to the Corinthian Christian. Because they have not visited Gilgal. And there are many who sit in the church, many who occupy the pulpit, many who declare the word of God, who have not taken the time to visit Gilgal. They have not taken the time to go through the process of sanctification, the process of purification. And as a result, they are as carnal as carnal can be. Their work with the Lord is inconsistent. Today they are praying with fire. Tomorrow they are insane. Today they are declaring the word of God. Tomorrow they are the one who are advocate for sin. They are living one day at the top and tomorrow in the valley. That is what happened when Gilgal has not been experienced in the life of an individual. Number two, when Gilgal has not been performed, the work at Gilgal has not been performed. The work of sanctification and holiness and righteousness have not been done in the light of an individual. You'll find contention and struggle. Bible tells in the book of Romans chapter 7, from verse 22, he says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the laws of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. In other words, Paul the Apostle is saying, how many of us here who we, who, how many of us sitting down here and how many of us who are listening to me, who doesn't want to serve the Lord? Everybody wants to serve the Lord. Everybody wants to pray. Everybody wants to have fellowship with the Lord. Everybody wants to raise up their hand and do like this and then by Ben Hinn, everybody falling down under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We all want to do that. But are we willing to pay the price? Paul, the, Paul, the apostle writing to the Roman church was telling them, he said that there is something that you desire in your heart, but there's something else that you are doing. In other words, the laws of God, you like the laws of God, but you lack the capacity to do it. And so he's telling you, the only reason why that is happening is because you have not taken the time to visit Gilgal. You have not taken the time to go through the sanctification experience. You have not taken the time to go through the spirit of holiness, purging and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And he said, as long as you remain in that condition, the first thing you will notice that carnality and inconsistency will be your portion. The next thing will that there will be contention because you will be thinking something and doing something else. There will be struggle between you and sin. You'll be fighting sin on a daily basis. You'll be wrestling with sin on a daily basis. And the Bible tells us, he said that sin shall have no dominion over you. But when you have not visited Gilgal, sin has dominion over the individual. The third thing you will see in the life of an individual who has not taken the time or spent the appropriate time at Gilgal to make sure the work is properly done is the work of accusation and condemnation. And that is why you find the enemy will always come and accuse. The enemy will always come and do what? And condemn the person. The Bible tells us, but there is no condemnation for to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But when you are not yet visited, if you have not yet visited Gilgal, or you did not stay long enough for the work to be done, accusation and condemnation become the part of that particular Christian because the enemy will mess you up. When you bow down and you kneel down, you want to pray, the enemy say, look at you. Did you know what you did last week? You know what you did yesterday? Even last night? Even just a few minutes before you came to church? Now you are all holy, holy, holy. You think God hears that kind of prayer? Look at this useless guy. Stop wasting your time. Get up and just have fun. The enemy start playing a number on you. As long as the work at Gilgal has not been perfected. As long as holiness and righteousness is not resident in our heart. As long as that Adamic nature that makes us to struggle with obeying God and obeying man. As long as you have that struggle going on, accusation and condemnation of the enemy will continue. And that's what you see in the lives of those who have not taken the time to visit or remain at Gilgal. The question then becomes, how do you know if you as an individual, if me as an individual, if we have gone to Gilgal and I've taken the necessary time to experience what Gilgal has to offer. What are the evidence of the life that I've been to Gilgal? What are the evidence? The evidence of the life that I've been to Gilgal is the evidence of peace with God. 
The Bible says there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is a peace that pass all understanding that comes upon your heart. You know that you know God. You know that you are walking with him. Despite all your inconsistencies, despite all your failures, you know that the presence of the Almighty God is with you. The second evidence is the evidence of the presence of the Almighty God. The Bible said that what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Are you the, you, for you are the temples of the living God. For God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they will be my people. When you have visited Gilgal, and you have taken the time to experience what Gilgal has to offer, the presence of the Almighty God walks with you. Not only that, the power of God is present in the life of such individuals. But ye shall receive power, the Bible says, after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. So in other words, as long as you take the time to visit Gilgal and to experience what Gilgal has to offer, the power of the presence of the Almighty God is resident with you. There is also that divine provision that the Lord makes available to those who have spent time in His presence. The Bible says the young, the young lion do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. So when you take the time to spend to spend time in His presence, to get rid of those Adamic nature, and you walk with the Almighty God, the provision of the Almighty God is always made available. But most importantly, when you know how you know somebody who is enjoying fellowship with the Almighty God, is joy. The Bible says righteousness, joy in the Holy Ghost. That is in the presence of God. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. You can never see a true child of God depressed because the depression is not from the Almighty God. A true child of God does not have the spirit of heaviness because he says, I've not given you the spirit of fear. You have not given you the spirit of fear, but I've given you the spirit of boldness. So there is no heaviness. The spirit of heaviness does not belong to the children of God. So the evidence of that you have visited and you have taken the time to receive what Gilgal has to offer is the joy of the Almighty God that is always with you. And that is why you find that even in terrible situations, the presence of the Almighty God always, you know, the joy of the Almighty God is always resident with His people. And that's why the psalmist says, they go from strength to joy, from strength to strength. Every one of them, in, everyone in, in, in Zion, appear before God. So as you find, as you walk with the Almighty God, and you take time to purge yourself, and you become an instrument and a vessel in His hand, the joy of the Almighty God continues to walk with you. The question now becomes, how do you access this Gilgal experience? How do you access it? Because it's a gateway for the experiencing of the lifelong anointing. Then how do you access this particular Gilgal experience? Gilgal experience only come to those who are humble enough to know that they lack it. Okay? Not the people who are trying to who are trying to adjust and play the game. There are some humility that comes that is only manifested in church. Where you talk to the pastor and you are all humble and nice. But as soon as you cross the road and then you turn on the right person, the true person now comes out. And that's why I tell you, boy, don't mess with me. All the way we did for church now, church, we're there outside here now, you know, so you can't mess me up. What it simply means that I, I mean, you can't, the father I call Jesus doesn't, I'll put Jesus, I'll put the Bible aside and I will deal with you. That's a deal. So you find out that when you want to experience the Gilgal experience, you must have the humility to be able to recognize and to be able to know that this particular experience that has been described in scripture is not yet in my life because there's still anger. There's still animosity. There's still gossip. There's still pride. All those things that the Lord Almighty says does not want, they are still there. He said the things in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He said they are of the world. He said they are not of the Father. And if you notice that all those things are still there, then you know that you have not yet had the experience at Gilgal. So how to access this? Number one is through humility and the recognition of lack. Number two is a sincere hunger and thirst. The Bible says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness because what? They shall be filled. There has to be that hunger. There has to be that desire. I think it was the psalmist who said, as the deer pants after water, so my soul pants after you. There has to be that hunger. Because if you try to feed somebody who is not hungry, what happens? They mess up the food. 
The grace of God cannot be released into the life of an individual who is not interested in it. So for us to be able to access the Gilgal experience, there has to be humility and realization that we lack it. Number two, the sincere hunger and thirst. And then number three, there has to be a personal search in prayer. And say, Lord, do something in my life. Don't leave me like this. I know that I'm not there yet. I know that I'm lacking. I know there are issues going on in my life. I know there are so many things that I need to do. But I'm asking this very morning that, Lord, you do a new walk in my spirit. Walk inside of me, oh God. I know that I'm weak. I know that I cannot stand. I know that my sins are before you. And that was why David was one of the most beloved of the Almighty God. Because David never tried to hide himself before the Lord. He said, my sins are ever before you. To you only have I sinned. In other words, David recognized that this particular experience, yes, I must have had it at one point in time, but I still have issues. There are areas of my life where I'm struggling, and I need your thought. And David will go to the Lord in prayer, searching and saying, Father, perfect your work inside of me. And that is what you need if we are going to access and experience this Gilgal experience that we're talking about. And then finally, you have to appropriate it by faith. Everything that the Lord Almighty has given you. The Bible said that he has blessed us with all heavenly blessings. With all spiritual blessings, the heavenly places through, you know, through Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, I think 16 and 17. There he's telling us that, that the blessings of heaven has already been given unto you. Then you need to be able to appropriate it by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 tells us, For he, has made, for he, for he had made him sin for us. Who knew no sin? Why? So that we can become the righteousness of God. In other words, Christ has already paid the price. When you pray in, sincer in sincerity of heart, as you seek the Almighty God, and as you humble yourself in His presence, when you pray, the Lord is saying that, appropriate it by faith. Begin to see yourself that Christ has already won this victory for you, and begin to live in the reality of that particular victory. Because as long as you try to do it in your own ability and strength, you will fail. It's as simple as that. The Bible says that by the arm of the flesh, by the arm of the flesh shall no man prevail. In your own strength, you cannot be holy. In your own strength, you cannot be righteous. But when you depend on the grace of God, when you depend on what Christ has already done for you through faith, and you do your own part by praying and seeking and desiring it, say God releases it upon us. For He has made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ in Him. As long as you are working with Christ, the grace of God is available, is available for you. So accessing the Gilgal experience requires an appropriation of faith. Now, brothers and sisters, it is one thing to be saved. Okay? It's one thing to say, yes, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's another thing to experience the lifelong anointing church. And you must go through the road of holiness. You must go through the road of righteousness. You must go through the road of sanctification. Because the Bible tells us that without holiness, no man can see the Lord. So please understand that. It requires holiness, it requires purification, it requires sanctification. Elisha had to go through Gilgal for him to be able to access what Elijah was carrying. Elijah has to come to a place of circumcision, a place of purification, a place of holiness before he can access the lifelong anointing. Experiencing the lifelong anointing will not happen until you go through the same thing. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he required it from Elisha, why do you think he's going to give you an exception? Why do you think he's going to change his rule because of me or because of you? Or because now we are living in the 21st century, so those, those laws never apply. It doesn't work that way. What Elisha went through, it will, happen, will go through. If we want to experience the lifelong anointing, it will not happen until we go through our own Gilgal experience. It will not happen until our hearts are circumcised, until we are sanctified. The question this morning is, have you gone through your own Gilgal experience? Do you even know there is even a Gilgal experience? Uh, do we even know that there's a need for us to be holy? Do we think that God Almighty will just give us a pass? Are you sanctified? Like I said, it is not enough to be born again. You have to move forward in the race. You have to become separated unto the Lord. You have to become holy. 
You have to become a righteous person, properly aligned with the Almighty God. The Adamic nature in your life must be removed. You must become a spirit-filled believer. And then you can now begin to experience all that God has in store for you. The question, like I said again, is have you gone through your own Gilgal experience? Are you sanctified? Have you been purified? Are you living a holy life? Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.